Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Kathy Reimer. I'm your presenter for the evening. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that uh, you'll, you'll be able to pick up a few tips and tricks during this presentation on giving your yard a new look, whether you're starting from scratch or whether you're just you know, redoing a portion of your yard. Uh, there's going to be several examples, uh, photographic examples of yards that have um, been transformed into a usable space. And of course, if you have any questions, type those in as we go and we'll uh, answer those. And we have an, we'll also have a, an, a, uh, a question and answer period at the end of the class. All right, as Drew mentioned, I do have a little experience in uh, landscaping and water conservation. I used to work for the city of Chandler, but I'm also a master gardener with the University of Arizona and a certified arborist. So let's get started. There are several class materials that you can refer to as we're going through the presentation tonight. One is the resources list, and this will have uh, book references, website addresses, and even a, a reference to a CD, an online CD, that could be very useful as you're planning your landscape. There's another one called Converting to Xeriscape, which kind of helps you uh, review the steps on this process. 10, the top 10 landscape tips, a design checklist, and this just helps you focus on what's important to you in your landscape, and then you can plan from there. There are also a number of brochures, and these are available at your water conservation office, or uh, some are stocked at the local libraries, and these are also online. So on your reference list, you can see these online as well. So I know you're getting anxious to uh, create some, some new glamour in your yard, perhaps, but here's the top 10 reasons to convert. Uh, to save time, uh, time is valuable to all of us, so that's a pretty good reason. Of course, saving water, money, also very important. Saving the air or our environment. Uh, maybe even setting an example for your neighbors or uh, maybe family members. Just think about those of you that have grass, you could have no more mowing, which that'll free up a lot of time, money, water, air, all the above, basically. So just to kind of give you a reference, and this is whether you have grass or not, um, we average eight inches of rain a year, sadly. We haven't had that eight inches in a, a number of years, but the average lawn needs over 60 inches a, of water a year. So you can see there's a big amount that we have to make up using water from our local water uh, supplier, <clears throat> which in your case is probably your city. And lawns are often overwatered, sometimes grossly overwatered. A xeriscape will use half to two thirds less water than the same area in grass. So that's a, a pre pretty big incentive to convert to a xeriscape. So just think about it this way. Uh, this is a, we're gonna assume this is a 3000 square foot area of lawn. It needs about 105,000 gallons of water for the grass. But if you convert it, it only needs about 44,000 gallons. So that's a pretty substantial savings. So where do we live? This is a question for you. It's not, it's not going to be one of the poll questions, but um, we live in this wonderful desert. And those of you that, uh, that know the name of the desert, you can say it out loud, say it to your neighbor if you're sitting with someone.
our cities are surrounded by desert. Sometimes it's hard to realize when we're you know, in our neighborhoods and um, we don't see the natural desert, but we're surrounded by it. Our this area where we live, uh, if those of you that have been here through the summer, you know it gets pretty darn hot. And on average, we have about 110, okay, wait for it. Those are the days with temperatures over 100 degrees. However, last year, we totally smashed the records. We, there were 144 days of temperatures over 110. That was, it was really hot. Just another reason to think about, you know, perhaps converting a lawn area. And this is published by the, um, the drought monitor, the USDA drought monitor. It's from last week, but they update it every week. And you can see that our area in the Southwest uh, is being grouped by what they call an exceptional drought. It's just pretty darn dry right now. So we need to, I know there's rain forecasted later in the week. Hopefully we'll get more than just a sprinkle. So what does Xeriscape mean? You may have heard that term or you may have seen it written. Um, it's, it's a word that was just kind of a made up word, but it's derived from xeros, the Greek word for dry, and scape, like as in landscape. And put them together and you get Xeriscape. And it just means using plants that are adapted to your region that don't need as much water. And to help you remember how to pronounce it, because everybody mispronounces this word, just think about these terms. So xeric environments are our deserts. Xerophytes are desert plants. Xerox, now that's one you should remember. Xerox, that's a dry copy. Xeriscapes, those are landscapes that are dry. Not totally dry, but fairly dry. This is not a xeriscape. This is a xeroscape. But sometimes people that see the word xeriscape mispronounce it and call it a xeroscape. But we don't we don't want you to have this in your yard. So a xeriscape should be colorful and interesting and have a variety of native or desert adapted plants. Here's another example. It's got uh, a tree in the center of this landscape, a mesquite tree, and underneath there's some filtered shade. So other things can benefit from that, other plants. Here's another that um, doesn't use a wide variety of plants, just uh, four or five, but it's a very appealing landscape. Another xeriscape with a mixture of some trailing ground cover, the purple lantana, plus some prickly pear cactus and some other desert adapted plants. And just as having a xeriscape doesn't mean you can't have a pool. Here's one that uh, includes a pool and even a small area of grass. And it's still classified as a xeriscape. Think about layers. We've got the, uh, of course, the, the turf and then some ground cover type plants like the purple lantana, the mid layer of shrubs, and then the canopy layer of the trees. Another xeriscape. This is a home in downtown Phoenix in the historical district where they don't use fences to, to define property lines. They use those giant oleanders. So the homeowner wanted to keep the integrity of the historic district, but they did remove some grass and in, in, install some desert adapted plants, including the Palo Verde that you see, as well as uh, in the foreground, there's um, pink primrose. There are some principles of Xeriscape and that includes, of course, planning, uh, using appropriate turf areas, your irrigation, grading, using mulches, whether they're organic or inorganic. And then, of course, using the low water use plants, followed by appropriate maintenance. And because we can use our outdoor areas for a big portion of the year, 
Yeah, it can be an extension of your living space, but uh, try and keep it appropriate to the architecture of your home, of course, your lifestyle, style, our region, and even our, our climate, as well as your budget. And don't forget color. We're not going to spend a lot of time on color tonight, but I would encourage you to take a look at the at a past presentation called Color Your World, and it's on the City of Chandler website. I've got a slide coming up that'll give you the web address. But color in our landscape is very important. It keeps it interesting and, um, and beautiful. Red, orange, and yellow are considered hot and warm colors, not because they're hot to the touch, of course, but they make you think that it's warm. It's going to trick your mind. So hot red, orange, and yellow are the hot colors. And here's an example. This is a pretty bold landscape with lots of red. It might not be something you could uh, use in your front yard, but perhaps your backyard, you could use paint on an existing fence or wall. And then the cool calm colors are blue, purple, greens. They have a calming effect on your mind. Again, they kind of trick your mind into thinking calm and cool. So these colors, we have a lot of hot places in our yard. So the cool and calm colors might be something to incorporate there. And here's an example of kind of a cool looking landscape. They've got some muted colors, definitely not red like the last one. And as I mentioned, you can learn more about using color in your landscape by just viewing this uh, Color Your World Quest video. It's hosted on the City of Chandler website at, this, uh, at the address chandleraz.gov slash water. And just follow the links to the educational resources and that should take you to this uh, class video from a previous class. Okay, there's some steps for converting. Now I know not all of you have grass, but um, the steps that are used here, some of them can be incorporated into a new landscape as well. So having a plan, for example, uh, those of you that have grass, you need to figure out how to remove it or kill it, grading your yard, putting in your irrigation or modifying it if you've got an existing one. And of course, planting and mulching your plants, the maintenance, and then finally, you know, enjoying your yard. So having a plan. It's kind of important to, uh, to, to map out or put on paper what you want or what you think you might want. So you can do a site analysis and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but creating a needs and wants list. It's okay to plan big and then you know, take a look at it and you think, well, that's not in the budget for this year. Maybe I can just do part of it or you know, do some steps along the way. But if you don't write it down, then it might be something that you'll forget and want to put it back in later on. It might not be as easy to do that. So just make a needs and wants list. It doesn't have to be um, you know, something that you'll use right away, but it, you might refer to it as you go along. Also putting down a, a bubble diagram of places where you might want things, that's important. Designing outdoor rooms on paper is kind of the same thing. And then finally, you know, selecting the, the, your plants and then doing your irrigation system. So on your wish list, here's some things you might want to use or to incorporate, you know, a play area, especially if you have uh, children or grandchildren, maybe entertaining is something you like to do, attracting wildlife, maybe a, just a quiet place to relax is, uh, is on your bullet bucket list. Color and shade, I think we all need shade, especially uh, because we live here in the desert. But um, even installing a, something like a vegetable or fruit garden, a pool or a spa, I mean, the lists can go on and on and on. But here's, those are just a few that you might want to think about incorporating. This is just an, something to give you some ideas. 
this is this from the Society of Landscape Architects, and they did a survey. And in the category for outdoor living spaces, they found that people uh, valued these particular things, not in, in no particular order, but things like the grills and fire pits, you know, seating and lighting and ele water elements and, and so on. And those might be some ideas for you to put on your wish list. Right down to the sinks, <laughs> the outdoor kitchens. Your reference list, the top 10 landscape tips, this includes grading your yard, you know, using boulders, the type of granite that you might want to use, grouping plants, uh, thinking about your views, whether you want to conceal views or enhance a view, selecting themes. Uh, we have a, a few themes coming up here on the next slide, I think. Of course, keeping conservation in mind, using hardscape, those would be uh, things like your uh, you know, pathways, concrete pathways and heart, hardscape elements. And then finally, of course, the flowers and native plants. So here are some landscape themes. There's more than just these listed here, but this might give you uh, some ideas. So Mexican, Mediterranean, you know, rustic, Maybe you just want something that's natural. You can even create a tropical landscape using desert adapted plants. There's also specialized areas like, uh, you know, plants and areas for birds and butterflies, maybe meditation, even religious. And a few rules to keep in mind as you're planning your landscape. Try to keep it simple. Decide on a main theme or goal. That will really help you focus on what you want to incorporate or what you want your landscape to look like. Use a couple of focal points. Try to have a short plant material list. That's the one I always struggle with because I want them all. And something that might help you is to take pictures of landscapes that look really nice. Um, look through books like um, you know, perhaps Phoenix Home and Garden or even the uh, brochures that the cities offer. You might want to create a Pinterest page so that you can keep track of the photos of the landscapes that you really like. A few more techniques. Try to work with Mother Nature. You know, we live in a desert and some plants just are not going to be happy here regardless of how hard you try. If you create a natural look, it, uh, you'll, the result will be an informal landscape that's uh, usually easier and less costly to maintain. Try working with odd numbers of plants, so three, fives, and sevens, especially with smaller plants, you can get away with the five and the seven category, instead of just, you know, one or two kind of you know, work with the odd numbers. And then framing views, we kind of mentioned that earlier. You can lock a view or enhance a view with plants. This is a photograph of a home from the Xeriscape brochure, which is in hard copy or online, but it kind of gives you um, a, a, a visual image of the things we've been talking about. So it's got um, some boulders, it's got low growing plants, some ground cover type plants. It has some shrubs. So talk about these levels. And then of course the tree canopy. And instead of having just a solid walkway up to the front door, they've staggered it a little bit. So it's a little more interesting. If you try to create masses of plants and layering your plants, it, it's, the result will be a much more interesting landscape to look at. But don't try and cover up every inch of space. Leave open space so that your eyes can rest as, it, as they scan through a landscape. Remember that some plants are really big. We have some huge cacti and you may only need one or two, but uh, try and limit those. If with raised planters, uh, plants that grow over the edges and kind of spill down look really attractive. And 
here is an example of a landscape that has some open space, has a young tree, of course, here in the front, even with a, an area of turf. And if you'll notice, the edge of the turf has a curved border. And this is really effective for small landscapes because instead of using a straight line to define the edge of the grass, the curve actually slows your eye down because it follows that line and it creates the impression of a larger space. It's one of those visual tricks. So if you have the opportunity to create curves in your landscape, it will make a smaller large or smaller space look much bigger. For walkways, you don't have to have just solid concrete. Think about, you know, breaking it up. This happens to be, well, I, I think it's flagstone, but they're awfully big pieces, but they've uh, left spaces in between. So it's a little more interesting to look at. This is a concrete walkway, but instead of having it just straight, the pieces are different sizes and they've kind of staggered them. So it looks more, to me, it looks like a zipper. And uh, it's just a little more interesting to look at. Here they've taken pieces of colored pottery and put them in between the uh, flagstone pieces to just give it some color and a little more interest. And I love this one, although it, the labor involved in putting those little stones in each of the spaces, it's gotta be so intense, but it's a beautiful product. And here is a solid concrete walkway, but it's curved. And uh, this also is, makes it more interesting to look at. And notice how it kind of curves around the back of the building. And it makes you want to go there. It, it, makes you, it leaves you wondering what's behind there. At least it does me. If you don't want to use concrete, you can use granite. And here they've taken granite with a little border and they put some flagstone pieces in it and created a nice walkway. This home has a number of different types of, of you know, patio areas and walkway areas. Over on the far left, it almost looks like they have terracotta tile under the patio. And then the, the sidewalk, it, look, it looks like it's the exposed um, sort of aggregate concrete where the chairs are located. To me, that looks more like flagstone pieces. So don't be afraid to mix it up. And you can have just plain granite. Here's a, a, a landscape example where they have a walkway <clears throat> through this xeriscaped area. And the walkway happens to be what they call quarter minus granite, which is very small and it compacts very well. So it makes a nice stable surface to walk on. So with a site analysis, you take a look at your house and your property, keeping in mind your lifestyle, your surroundings, and then we also have to think about the sun and the weather. And you can do this on paper, you can use graph paper, make a footprint of your home. You, you may have one, but most people have to create their own. And all you're doing is putting the outline of your house on your property. So you can decide where you want to put things. And you think about the sun angles, the wind direction, how people move through your property, how water moves on it or off of it. Uh, again, your views and then your, where you want to put your plants. Our sun uh, angles change drastically depending on the season. And in the winter, the little illustration on the left, you can see that, uh, let's say it's you know December 21st, the shortest day of the year, there's a lot of, of your yard that is going to be in the shade, and depending on how, how your home sits on your property and whether it faces you know south or north or east or west. But it, regardless, 
there's a lot of shade in the winter time. The sun rises low on the horizon, kind of stays low, the days are short. Compared to summertime, and here we're looking at probably, you know, June 21st, that's on the right, where we get the sun is very intense, so we have very little shade, even on the north side of the house. And this could influence where you want to place things. You wouldn't want to put a vegetable garden on the north side of your house in the winter because it would be in shade most of the time. So keep that in mind. Now some plants, of course, prefer shade. Some can tolerate full sun. But this will give you an idea of you know, the seasons and the impact it has on your plant placement. This photograph just kind of gives us an, an example of some of the things we had in the previous slides. So it's got a focal point. There are a lot of different textures here. There's soft things, those pink sort of soft looking plants on the right. Those are, it's a bunch grass, bunching grass, and they bloom like this in the fall with those pink flowers. So, and there's, so there's lots of color. There's color from the flowers, there's color from the grass, even the fence has color or the stones in the front. And there are curves. So a lot of the things, as I mentioned, that we saw in previous slides, it's all sort of packaged into one illustration here. You can also create special spaces. So whether this is for children or pets, maybe you'd like to entertain, or if you're an exercise buff, there are spaces you can create for recreation or relaxation. And I have a few examples of these before we get to how to really, how to take out your grass, assuming you have grass, how to take it out successfully. So kids, uh, you know, if, if you have a large tree, they might enjoy a swing, a tire swing like this. But any area where you have are going to have children or create a children's space. It needs to have easy access and high visibility, of course, so you can keep an eye on things. And it needs to be secure. Providing shade, you can do that with trees if you have them, or you can use the colorful sail cloths to um, create instant shade until your trees grow a little larger. And don't forget the native plants. This would include, you know, the desert trees. We have durable native plants and colorful wildflowers. The uh, landscape plants for the Arizona desert, the booklet, that has over 200 low water use plants that, uh, that should grow uh, vigorously in your yard and not die. <laughs> Oh, that last slide, that, let me see if I can go down or up, let's see. So on the far left, that's just, it, it's a caterpillar. Some people are, you know, they're worried about caterpillars, but in this case, you know, they turn into beautiful butterflies. So uh, sometimes they're okay to have in our landscapes. <clears throat> I, I mean, you, can, you can even create a sensory landscape. So places that look interesting, there's our plants that make noise. I know that sounds funny, but there, yeah, some plants, when the seed pods dry and open, they pop. And uh, so that could be something to, uh, to listen for. Of course, smell. Many plants have uh, aromatic oils in their leaves, and there's a definite you know, aroma. Um, some plants you can eat, you know, not just from a vegetable garden, but there are some landscape plants that are pretty tasty, too. Maybe you have pets and you want to create a pet-friendly landscape. The one on the upper right, even they even have a fire hydrant there. It's a, it's got a little uh, you know waiting space so the dogs can uh, get their feet cool. But you know having the raised beds like this, that I think discourages dogs from you know getting in there and digging. It uh, makes the plants a little more safe. Maybe you want to entertain. It could be something as simple as a fire pit. Here's something. Here's another example. It's uh, has some nice outdoor furniture. Instead of a fire pit, they have a fireplace. 
And another example, an outdoor fireplace. I noticed in this example where how they painted the little pony wall blue. That it gives you just some additional color in the landscape. For nighttime entertainment, this is one of my favorite slides. They, they really put in, uh, you know, a nice barbecue area, seating area. That's well lit at night. And here in the desert, we can really enjoy our nighttime. It, was, it gives us a break from the summer heat. We watch movies outside. For those of you that have those small, narrow spaces that you're not quite sure what to do with, this might give you some ideas. This is a, a Steve Martino design, and this is a retractable awning, and which gives you shade without having to plant something in the middle. Most trees are too large to plant in a, those small, narrow spaces, but this is a perfect solution. For outdoor rooms, you can use colorful ceramic pots and outdoor furniture, even some, you know, otherwise, you know, indoor elements like the mirror, and it creates a nice, attractive outdoor room. If recreation is uh, something that you're really interested in, this is an example of not only a little fire pit down there, but of course, outdoor golf. For exercise, you could have your own basketball court or a lap pool. But relaxation, I think, is one of the, the most popular. And there's nothing like the sound of water to kind of you know, take the edge off a busy day. There are all kinds of water uh, sort of design elements you can incorporate from bubbling fountains. I was gonna say babbling, but bubbling is better. Bubbling fountains. And this is uh, an outdoor pond, which is a totally enclosed ecosystem. It has a biological filter. And um, if, if you really you know, like this type of thing, it's, the trade-off is if you could you know, convert the same size area of lawn into a, a pond like this, you're kind of at a, a wash. It's kind of you know one-on-one -on -one equal conversion. Or maybe just a couple of nice chairs under the shady tree is your idea of relaxation. Here's another example. We just we have a nice little kiva out there and with a bench. But one of my favorites has got to be the hammock. That looks pretty nice. And it, if you grew a vine over the top to give you some additional shade, it would be just perfect. Focal points, these uh, kind of run the gamut on what you might want to include in your landscape. This is a little, uh, it looks like a water pump, but it's a little recircling, recirculating re pump. And a little Akiva as their focal point here. Even yard art could be considered a focal point. And don't forget the color. Now this little wall is actually um, 
used to conceal the fence, the fence, the pool equipment. And, um, and they, of course, painted it blue. It's beautiful. But if they had just left it concrete, it wouldn't have near the same effect. There's a little fountain in the background here, and they've used a number of uh, pretty bold colors, the, the purple and the orange. Color comes in many ways. Here's the uh, some nice chairs painted a, a pretty kind of a sky blue. And these folks were able to paint their windowsill, which not all of us can do. Okay, so how do you get rid of grass? How many of you have tried to get rid of grass? It can be pretty tough. Bermuda grass is great because it can tolerate our heat. It doesn't mind our alkaline soils, but if it's growing in the wrong place, like maybe it's in your flower bed, it can be a real bear to try and get rid of. So the key is to, if you're going to convert, is to kill all the grass and the weeds in that area. Because you don't want Bermuda growing back. There are a number of different methods, from mechanical to chemical to solarization. But one method that does not work is neglect. If you don't, if you say, oh, I'm just going to quit watering my grass, and then try and convert it. Um, the next time we get a heavy rain or maybe a, a nice monsoon season, that Bermuda, it's like, it's like reborn. It comes to life again. So the watering or withholding water does not work with Bermuda grass. This is uh, solarization. And it does work here, but the best time to use the, the plastic solarization is in the summertime. I'm not sure if you can wait that long, but you, you want to use clear plastic, not the black. You want to use the clear plastic and you'll have to leave it on for four to six weeks in the summertime. I know some people say, oh, I, I've heard black plastic works. Well, really the clear is the best because you want the grass to try and grow again so that it can die. If you could put the black plastic over, it doesn't always encourage the, the grass that's still you know, trying, struggling to grow to, to do so. And because um, we, we want to use all of its energy and die in the process. And, um, and of course, be exposed to the heat. So the clear plastic is the best. You can also try strip mulching or sheet mulching. This is a little more intensive. You have to create various layers, including an eight to 12 inch layer of mulch and alternate. You can use newspapers. You can use compost, um, but it has to be very, very deep. And again, the idea is to um, starve the Bermuda underneath. One of the best methods to get rid of Bermuda grass is using a systemic herbicide. And because it's a systemic, once you plant, uh, spray it on the leaf surfaces, the plant then absorbs it and relocates it to other areas. So the leaves, the stems, the roots, and in case of Bermuda grass, down into the rhizomes and the stolons. So it kills it all. It kills, kills the above ground and the below ground portion of the plant. The greater the leaf area, the more herbicide is going to be absorbed. It just, it makes that so logical, right? The, sometimes these products act slowly, so have some patience, but uh, it, and you have to apply them at the correct time of year. So you, you can get this done. We're a little early in the season right now. Usually May is better to apply some of these products, but um, I know my Bermuda grass, I've seen places where it's really growing, like on the south side of the house. and. I, I think I could probably use it there and it would work. But in general, if you're going to put it on a lawn, it might not be very effective right now. 
And here are some products. The active ingredient that you want to look for is called glyphosate. And it's, um, it's included at various concentrations in these products. But just look at the label and make sure that it says glyphosate. It might say, you know, 30% or if it's uh, super concentrated, it's 41%. And then you dilute it. Some products are ready to use. And you can try those as long as you, read, you must probably want to read the label and make sure it says that it will kill Bermuda grass. You don't have to buy the major brand name. You can buy the local home improvement store brand, like the orange bottle here. And it has, it has the same product, but it's probably about half the price. And when you apply the product, you want to wait until the grass is green and healthy. So right now, the Bermuda hasn't quite woken up yet from winter. When, when we get to May, when we get some of those 100 degree days, then it's usually growing enough, growing actively enough to absorb the product and have it, you know, kill all the parts. The best time, of course, is be in the morning. So we'll have all day to work. And avoid uh, the windy days like today. Don't spray, spray on a windy day. Wait for a calm day. Some of the areas here in Chandler and Queen Creek are old agricultural fields. And you may have a, a looks like grass. You may have a grass growing in your lawn that's actually nut sedge. These have a much more coarse blade to the leaf area. And if you mow your grass and you find it looking kind of spiky in the next couple of days, you might have nut sedge. It actually is not a grass at all. And it grows from these little underground tubers, kind of like you know a mini potato, but that's why they call them nuts and call it nut sedge. If you have this in your lawn, you can mix a product right into your glyphosate and spray it all at once. In other words, you don't have to mix two separate products. You can mix it together and spray it. Two brand names you can look for are Manage and Sedge Hammer. They're fairly, well, I say they're, they can be expensive. And maybe if your neighbor has a problem with nut sedge, you could split the price and, you know, split the product and go in that house on it. So here's some tips to increase the effectiveness of the herbicide. You want the grass to be actively growing. So you want to water it, you want to baby it, you want it to grow and green up so that it's going to be able to process the herbicide. Don't mow. Don't mow your grass. Wait at least three to five days longer if you can stand it. And then there should be enough leaf surface area for you to spray. Spray in the morning, we mentioned that earlier. Don't spray right before you're for a rain. I know here we don't have to worry too much about that. Um, and you might want to turn your irrigation system off before the day before you plan to spray. And that way you won't have the irrigation sprinklers coming on while you're trying to get this product on. You can add nitrogen to the spray tank. It just helps the, the, the grass grow a little faster because that's a fertilizer. It increases it encourages it to grow more, but that's not, not necessary. The thing that is necessary is to always follow label instructions. And on your on the label, each product is going to have the, uh, the safety instructions. And it's also going to have some key words such as caution, warning, or danger. And these are, they call them the toxicity. So the caution is slightly toxic. If it says warning, that means moderately toxic. And if it says danger, then of course it's severe. And always choose the least toxic option. And the recommendations on the label are gonna tell you, you know, wash your hands, use eye covering, wear gloves. Uh, you can wear a mask, a, a respirator and, uh, change your clothes after you apply the product. Those are just some, some safety uh, 
chips. Now these signal words, this toxic, toxicity sig signal words, <laughs> they're not just in the, the products that I mentioned before, the glyphosate products. They also appear in organic herbicides. So just because it says organic doesn't mean it's not toxic. For instance, you'll see here that the first product listed is danger. And as you go down the line, you know, some say caution, some say danger. So just be sure and look at, if you're using organic products, look at those uh, labels on the product as well to make sure that uh, you're taking the right precautions before you apply it. Okay, you applied your herbicide and don't be surprised that if you apply the glyphosate, um, once you apply it, you want to continue to uh, treat your lawn like you love it, even though you might not, because you want the any residual grass to keep growing so you can spot treat it it's going to probably be two weeks after you put your original application on. So if some does grow back, don't worry. That's sometimes kind of normal, but you can just spot treat that. Okay, now, assuming that you've killed your lawn and you don't have anything growing back, what do you do next? Well, first of all, if you're going to be doing any digging, you want to be sure and call blue stake so that they can identify your utility lines. This is a free service but you want to be sure and call and you can just dial 811 they do have a regular 602 number but 811 will do it so after your grass has died you've got three choices you can scalp it using a mower just as close to the ground as you can you can rototill the area and then rake out the dead grass or you can use something like a sod cutter or a bobcat to remove the first three or four inches of the dead grass along with you know, some, some uh, soil as well. And here's some examples. So this is scalping. You see this in the fall when the um, landscape guys are out there cutting the grass really, really short before overseeding. So that's scalping. You cut it very short and then you can remove the uh, leftover dead grass pieces. Or you can rototill it and rake out the dead grass. Or you can use a bobcat or even a sod cutter and uh, scrape off the top three to four inches. Now in this photo, if you look behind the little bobcat, they've taken those that top layer with the grass and kind of stacked it over there. You can actually turn those pieces upside down and then landscape over the top of them. If the grass is dead, it's not going to be a problem. You don't have to, but that's that's one option for you. This is an opportunity to grade your yard. And grading, uh, you can create a third dimension. You can create mounds, you can create depressions, and um, it'll make your yard look a little more interesting. So here our bobcat is busy at work creating some mounds. And they're doing some raking. I'm going to give those mounds some shape. But be careful that you don't um, create mounds that look like grave sites. <laughs> so they should be gentle mounds. Um, you can create swales. These are depressed areas that can be used to capture rainwater. Think about rainwater harvesting. We don't get rain often, but when we do, it's nice to be able to save that water instead of letting it just you know, run off your, your property. And then you can also use boulders and uh, other rocks to help define your landscaped areas. Here's that same yard and you, the, um, you can see the raised areas where they're creating some mounds and then there are some depressed areas where they're creating places for rainwater to travel. And if you have plastic, this is a great time to get rid of it. Black plastic is not, um, it's not effective in our landscapes. You know, they put it down to keep weeds from growing, but that doesn't really work. And sometimes the plastic works its way to the surface and then it looks, you know, it's an eyesore. 
but it prevents water from penetrating into the soil. It also restricts oxygen from penetrating into the soil. So if you have plastic, now's a great time to get rid of it. And think about rainwater harvesting. Yeah, we need this rain, right? This is a little um, channel and they're just trying, it looks like they're trying to get rid of the water just as fast as they can. They're not trying to store any of it. But if you grade your yard so that you have some, some depressed, some gentle depressed areas, you can save some rainwater that will soak into the soil and it will help water some of the surrounding plants. This is one example, here's another one. And when the soil, when the water soaks in, which only takes a few hours, this is just a, a place where you can walk, it's like a pathway. But when it does rain, it fills up with water. And uh, then of course the plants nearby are really, really happy. And here is uh, water harvesting on a commercial scale. This is in front of a business. But again, it's depressed areas that save water instead of having it run down the road. And here's a kind of a before and after on a parking lot area that's pretty darn hard to look at. I mean, it's not very attractive at all. And they decided to do some rainwater harvesting here. So this is before, and this is after. So they have a nice pathway for pedestrian traffic, but they also created this channel in the middle here that saves some of the rainwater that comes off the parking lot. Here's a different angle and you can see the water that it's um, capturing. Just gives these trees a, a drink. And of course, some of the other landscape plants that are in there and it's a lot nicer to look at. In Tucson, they do a lot of curb cutting where they um, create landscaped areas just off the roadway and the only water they receive is from rainwater. So here's uh, an example of the, that area filling up and a happy child playing in the water. If you have an existing grass area that you're converting, you can rework the irrigation. You can save it and maybe convert it. Or you may have to, if you're just starting from scratch, you need to install an irrigation system. But here, are some options for you. So on the left, we have you know just abandoning what was there and starting over. In the middle, we've got uh, a new irrigation um, trench for the lines going on. And then on the far right, we have a retrofit. There's nothing if there's nothing wrong with your PVC lines, you know if they're not broken or leaking, you can convert them to drip. And here's, that's how they did this here. It's just a, you know, you cut into the PVC with a T and then a, an adapter that brings it from the PVC to the black poly line. So that's, can, that can save a lot of trouble as far as, you know, your, your drip line. And here's how you, here's how you do it. They make these little converters that change PVC to poly. One, the, in, in the upper left-hand picture, on the left end, that is glued onto your PVC. And then on the right end, that's where your half inch poly line hooks in. Now there's no glue with the poly. It's just, it's a compression fitting and it just it, you know, squeeze it right in there and it holds. The only thing you may have to add, let me go back one slide. The only thing you may have to add on a retrofit is a pressure reducer. Back at the valve, you'll, if you're gonna convert to drip from sprinkler, because sprinklers operate at full pressure, if you're going to convert to drip, you have to add a pressure reducer, and that's it. And those aren't really expensive. They're you know, less than $10. Some irrigation tips. If you're reworking your yard or, or installing a landscape for the first time, it's important to have a good design. And here's a, just a little illustration. I don't know if, you, if some of you that took the irrigation class, if they had this or not. But if you follow the different colors, so in the very front of this house, there's these little um, circles attached to the drip lines, those that represent the valves. But if you follow the red one, the red one goes out in front of the driveway into some shrubs, 
and it also goes back behind the house to some shrubs. The blue line goes in front of the driveway over to the side of the house, and I don't know if that represents a vegetable garden, but anyhow, it's different. And then the yellow line goes out to the right and it waters the trees. So they've got three separate valves watering three different types of landscape plants. And that's a good design because trees don't need to be watered near as often as shrubs. And if you have a vegetable garden, it needs to be watered a lot more often than trees or shrubs. Okay, now it's time to plant and mulch. So think about location. You know, if you've got this, a sunny area or a shady area, think about plants that will go in those places. And also keep in mind your colors. You can make some great plant combinations. And the, the brochures, especially the Xeriscape brochure, has some wonderful pictures. That's where this picture came from. Regionalism it just means that, you know, thinking about where we live and the desert and desert adapted plants are native and desert adapted plants do so well here. And um, wildlife, you know, our native wildlife like the native or desert adapted plants. This home really focused on the native plants. The yellow ones in front, those are desert marigolds. They've got a sweet acacia tree on the right, a young one looks like a mesquite there on the left. A highly underutilized plant is creosote. It grows wild on our desert and they're starting to bloom right now with these pretty little yellow flowers. It, you can, I, I would recommend if you plant one, you can water it for maybe the first six months and then wean it off your drip system. They can survive on native rainfall. So creosote, it's, they are the ones that give you that nice sort of fresh clean smell when the monsoon storms come off the desert. Yeah, that's the creosote. What about artificial turf? And a lot of people are interested in this and um, it has its purpose. If you want a green looking lawn, but don't want to have to water it, you might consider artificial turf. And it looks great in commercial areas and um, some landscapes, you know, have it in some residential uh, places have it in their landscapes as well. It can be a little pricey. And it does get fairly hot, especially in the summertime during the day. It cools off at night, but you wouldn't want to walk on it barefoot during the day. If you're going to do a conversion, you might uh, be eligible for a rebate. So in Chandler, if you take out, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 square feet of grass, you, you can apply for a $200 rebate and so on. The maximum is $3,000. But that would mean you'd have to take out 15,000 square feet of grass. So all the information is on the Chandler, City of Chandler website. But uh, think about it, why not get paid for uh, you know, taking out your grass? Now it's time to enjoy your landscape. You've done all that hard work. Again, our native and desert adapted plants are going to, to attract native Wildlife, not pigeons, not grackles, but some of our native wildlife, including virgin butterflies. And you can do this. I've got some before and after pictures just to give you some inspiration here. So here's a little house with some grass in the front yard. I think it looks kind of boring, but they did a really nice conversion. So here's how it looks now. They also got a new front door and I think some new front windows, but they added some flagstone pavers and uh, some Zurich type plants. There's even an oak teal by the front door. There's a home in Chandler and they did a conversion. They enclosed their uh, carport, made it into a garage and took out all the grass in the front yard. And here's how it looks now. Now, on the other side of that little wall, they have a nice patio area. And here's another home. This is a home in Tempe, but they let us borrow their slides. Now, keep your eye on the, the vegas, the little round, um, well, they're not little, but the round wooden beams in front. 
Yeah, that's pretty amazing, huh? And another home with a very small front yard. And they just decided to get rid of it, cut down on their maintenance. Small grass areas like this are very hard to water because the, the sprinklers always want to overspray. So this homeowner just decided to convert and not have to worry about that anymore. Another home in Chandler, and it had some grass and some desert plants, but they just decided to get rid of the remain remainder of the grass. And there it is. This is also a home in Chandler that had uh, grass in the front yard and they were at the end of a cul-de-sac. And you can see their property line in the lower right-hand corner that short little wall, that's the common area uh, for the HOA. And here's how their conversion turned out. Now, if you look closely, you can still see that little wall, but now it makes it look like it's all part of their yard. So uh, they kind of got that benefit of tagging onto the common area. Another conversion, they took out uh, some of these shrubs and some of the grass, not all. And lastly, this is the home where the bobcat was busy at work. And they, they left the big olive tree in the front, but they took out the, the grass. So here's how it turned out. It's a young landscape. There you go. Now, xeriscape is not just something that's done here in the desert. This is a picture from Texas, and uh, they use xeriscape principles there as well. This home had just this green ground cover in front, and they decided to take it out and install some plants that are um, you know, applicable for their region. If you need more resources, more help, this is the Xeriscape book I was talking about, which is also online. Uh, it'll have uh, it has a step by step how to the design process even has some graph paper in there and if you need professional services those are in there as well this is on your re resource list uh, as well as the, the the online website address This is the landscape plant book, which is also online with lots of uh, colored pictures. Once you get your landscape installed or plants installed, you'll need to water them. So here's a great irrigation guide, <clears throat> pardon me. This is also online, or if you prefer a hard copy, your city water conservation office can get you set up with that. This booklet was actually put together by the city of Scottsdale <clears throat> and the, the water conservation offices share resources. So this is, it's not like we're, we're stealing, we're sharing. And it's online and the address is on your resource list, but they had a revitalization workbook for some of the older 
areas in Scottsdale. And what they did is they created, I think there's six, six actual architectural drawings, and then the plants that they installed or, or that you could install, and they're all listed. So it gives you the names of the plants, how big they get, and so on. But the drawings, I thought, are so helpful to kind of help you visualize what type of landscape you might want to put in. Some have lawn areas, some don't, but uh, it's a great resource. Here's a close up. So this one I think they call, oops, there we go. This one they call Birdie Scape. So if you can see it has a little bit of lawn, it has uh, the little architectural symbols for plants, which are spelled out in the legend that goes with this. So it might be helpful for you to, to help, you know, give you some give you some ideas on what to do. Oh, there's the legend. And then this, the uh, Susie Chandler has a link for this online resource. It's uh, Waterwise Landscaping in Chandler. And the web address is on your resource list. But this has, oh, let me go back. This has actual examples of landscapes. You can search for plants. It has over 600 low water use plants in it. It also has individual design elements. It has like examples, 15 or 20 examples of each one, like walkways and um, patios, so those types of things. So that this would also be very helpful for you. Both the city of Chandler and the town of Queen Creek have references on their websites. So don't forget to take a look at those. And then I want to thank you all for joining us. And now we are going to go to the question portion of the presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. It was an awesome presentation. Um, we do have a couple, or let's, we just have the one question here, it looks like so far. Um, will systematic um, or systemic herbicide kill or impact uh, roots of citrus trees growing on the edge of uh, Bermuda grass? Okay, so a systemic herbicide kills anything it touches. So if you have a citrus tree, the only way it's going to kill that tree or, or hurt that tree is if you sprayed the trunk or some of the leaves of the tree. It doesn't travel through the soil. So if you spray it on, um, like say your Bermuda grass, it doesn't travel through the soil into the roots of your tree. So you're safe there. Awesome. I think that we'll just wait and see if there's any other questions that come through, but that was the only, oh, here's one. Um, what citrus trees are best? <laughs> what citrus? Oh, you know, it kind of depends on what you want to eat, what you like, if you like oranges or limes or, you know, whatever, grapefruit. The University of Arizona has a great website and it has a listing of low desert citrus varieties. And what I can do is I can send, or you tell me, Drew, if this will work, I can send Drew that link and he can maybe email it to you or get it to you somehow, but it gives you the, um, the varieties of all kind types of citrus that do well in the low desert. And um, that should, should give you an idea of which ones you know, would be choices for you. Does that work? Yeah. Too? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, yeah. If you want to provide me that, I can I can send out an email to, um, to everyone, or or just the person that requested it. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll just share it with everyone just so that everyone has that information. Yeah, that'd be um, great. I'll I'll get that up to you uh, tonight or tomorrow. Okay, that'd be perfect. Um, the next question: uh, Are there any favorite trees or shrubs to attract birds? To attract birds, well, um, hummingbirds, of course, like flowering trees, and they like uh, they, they'll visit the desert willows. But if you're if you're trying to attract like nesting birds, like doves and um, burden, those are little like canary type birds, or even I was say cactus wrens, but they actually prefer uh, more the the desert cacti. So I guess I'm a little, maybe you could be more specific on what type of birds you want to attract, 
or if, if we just attract, want to attract birds and give them nesting sites, that's a, that's a, I think any of the desert trees are going to be good ones. It's the sweet acacias work really well because they are thorny, which we don't like, but birds like them because it gives them some protection from predators. Hmm. So maybe you can, if you, if you can send us a little more uh, detail on what type, what kinds of birds or be a little yeah. more specific, that would help. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep a lookout for if okay. they put any specifics in there. Um, the next question is, I have, um, I have three existing small raised vegetable gardens in my backyard. I shouldn't spray any lawn killer around that area, should I? Well, again, as long as you, as long as the product doesn't touch your vegetables, it won't hurt them. And what you can do if you're spraying close by, you can take a piece of cardboard or something like that and use it as a barrier in between where you're spraying and your vegetable area. So as you go along, just kind of hold that piece of cardboard up so that there's no drift into the vegetables. That will help. But the spray, the product is not going to migrate as I mentioned before, it's not going to migrate through the soil into your vegetables. It only would get there if the product touched the leaves. Kathy, this is Connie. Yes. Um, that we had a gentleman ask a question earlier or send a, a message concerned about the glyphosate. Whenever we talk about that, removing grass and uh, some of the lawsuits with it. Um, what do you recommend? I mean, I don't know if it's been proven to cause cancer, but um, I know that that's about the only thing that really kills grass. Um, but what what do you recommend someone who's going to use it to do? Should they contact their physicians or what do you recommend? Okay, sure. Um, yes, there has been a lot in the news about the, the uh, people using glyphosate, which is, you know, originally was in the product Roundup by Monsanto. But if you listen to those commercials carefully, it says people in the landscape industry that regularly used glyphosate. And it's, it, I don't, unless I'm mistaken, homeowners only use this product periodically, you know, once or twice a year maybe. Um, but you still wanna take all the precautions. You wanna wear, you know, the gloves and um, eye protection when you're spraying and follow the, the recommendations on the label, but but that is a little misleading. And I'm not going to say I mean, any product can hurt you if, in the wrong circumstances. But it sounds like these were cases where the landscape workers used it on a regular basis, and for whatever reason, they um, they may or may it may or may not have you know health issues that were contributed to the the product, and I think it even says May in that in those commercials. But I have seen landscape guys out there in the field with, you know, the backpacks, the backpack sprayers, and the product is just kind of sloshing all over them. So I I'm not going to say it it won't happen to a, a resident, but I think residents are a lot more careful about how they use that product, and it's up it's up to um, the individual, of course. But I think as long as you take safety precautions, you should be fine. Okay, thank you. All right, sure. Uh, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, one is the, the one that asked about the trees. She said, I currently have a desert willow and you're right, it attracts hummers. Are there any other hummer favorites? Oh, hummingbirds also like the cascalote which is um, Cecilpenia cacalaco, but the common word or common name for it is cascalote, and it, it blooms in the fall with yellow flowers. They like that one. Um, I'm trying to think of other trees, because how many birds like you know, trees, trees with flowers that have, trees with flowers that have a nectar source, and um, I'm just not, I'm not having any come to mind right at the moment with the, uh, that'd be another one maybe i can send a list to drew and have him post it yeah, okay so i can i can send okay. that out there are there are a lot of shrubs that work for hummingbirds too so maybe we can 
put a hummingbird list together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's another question. Is there something that can be done at planting stage to prevent tree roots from growing out too far? Well, I guess my question would be why the concern? Because um, you trees should not be planted, you know, close to structures, close to walls. And if it's just a recipe for disaster because the tree roots can um, depending on the tree, of course, can vault sidewalks, they can vault the foundations of fences. Um, the rule of thumb is no closer than the radius of the mature canopy. So if a tree is going to uh, have a mature canopy of 30 feet, you don't want it more than 15 feet closer to a structure. Now, having said that, they do make a product called I have to think of it. Oh, okay. It's called Bio Barrier. It's a fabric that's been impregnated with copper hydroxide. And what it does is when a root tip touches it, it kills the tip. So then the root branches and grows a different direction. And that could be helpful if it's uh, a tree is, you know, near a sidewalk or something that, you know, there's an issue with, you know, possible bolting. But yeah, it's called Bio Barrier. Okay, also, we have another question. I believe this is the last one I can see right now. It says, is it a good idea to not overseed Bermuda grass with ryegrass in order to let the Bermuda grass rest and rejuvenate? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, usually, if you if you like overseeding, I mean, and a lot of people do, they like the winter lawns, but it's always a good idea to let your grass to skip an overseeding once every maybe three or four years, because what happens is when people get ready to oversee, they scalp the lawn, like that picture we saw. Um, they cut the grass very, very short. Sometimes the landscapers quit watering the lawn for a couple of weeks before they scalp it and overseed. And this, the timing is so bad because it's just at the time when Bermuda is starting to store energy for the winter to get it you know, through the winter and then so it can grow up, grow back in the spring. And when you start scalping it and withholding water, then it doesn't get to complete that process. So in the spring, when Bermuda should be growing and greening up, it's just, it's starved and it takes a long time for it to grow again. So skipping the overseeding every few years is a good idea. Okay, thank you, Kathy. That looks like about all of the questions I have for now. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Those are great questions. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Amazing presentation. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending the workshop today. Um, here, or I guess on the previous slide, um, you could, uh, there is our contacts. There they are. Thank you. <laughs> Um, you can certainly reach out to uh, us and, um, you know, for more information or for um, other resources. Uh, Kathy's going to provide me with some uh, resources that I'll, I'll send out um, later this week uh, to everyone that attended and registered. Um, we do have a short survey right, right after this class tonight um, that will pop up once you exit this WebEx. Um, we do appreciate it if you would just please take a minute to complete that um, so we can use it to improve our classes in the future. Um, thank you again, and we hope everyone enjoys uh, the rest of the week.